Welcome back to chapter 11, students. Um, we are going to keep on with our first big idea, the control of gene expression. Um, we're going to look at how uh, we can use fruit flies, actually, to examine gene expression. Fruit flies have a, a very short lifespan, um, and so sometimes they make a really good study organism um, because we can sort of look at a whole life cycle and all of that uh, just in a very relatively short period of time. Um, and there is um, sort of a series of RNA and proteins in the embryo um, that control sort of the development of this fruit fry from a fertilized egg. And what, what they have found is that um, there's this sort of master sort of control gene, sort of like the big boss gene, called a homeotic gene. Um, and it sort of regulates um, sort of other groups of genes that will determine sort of um, the different anatomy of, of these these particular fruit flies. So like where does a particular body part sort of develop in the fly? Um, and so you can see um, there's genes for the eyes, there's genes for the antennas, there's genes for sort of this extra pair of legs um, sometimes that they get. Um, and so um, what kind of controls all of this is these homeotic genes. Um, so for instance, here is our egg um, surrounded uh, by uh, what we call a follicle. So this is the sort of the egg inside the ovary. The egg cell will sort of talk to the follicle cells. They sort of communicate to each other. Um, as different genes get expressed, the growth of the egg um, kind of continues and the mRNA that sort of codes for the head of the fruit fly sort of ends up in um, one particular part of uh, the, the follicle. You get sort of more gene expression turning on and, and turning off and lots of mitosis and then fertilization from the sperm um, and so you end up with sort of these different body segments and, and the head sort of developing um, on one side. Um, you get this homeotic gene sort of turning on and you get sort of these then cascades of gene expression um, that will ultimately result in a fruit fly um, that has a, a particular anatomy. Um, we can use all kinds of different science and different um, technology to um, help us look at how genes work together. Um, for instance, we can do something called nucleic acid hybridization, um, wherein um, we can kind of hybridize uh, the nucleic acids, the DNA and the RNA, uh, that allows us to identify cells. Uh, so we're looking at, let's say, a target gene for some specific trait. Um, by hybridizing it with another one, um, it helps us to identify um, where these genes get expressed. Um, we can also do something called a DNA microarray. Um, that sort of gives us a picture of um, what uh, genes have either been sort of turned on or turned off, expressed or, or not expressed um, in a particular cell. Um, so here you can see um, some of this hybridization. Um, they used um, some pigment um, with and hybridized it with some mRNA. Um, so here the green uh, got hybridized with mRNA that is expressing gene A. Um, the blue um, hybridizes with the mRNA that are expressing gene B. And so you end up sort of seeing this sort of alternating pattern, um, but you can see in which cells there are expressing the gene A and which cells are expressing gene B just by looking at the color because they've sort of hybridized the mRNA um, with these, these little pigment molecules. Um, and so you can see again sort of how the, this is still in a fruit fly. Um, of how the different body segments are developing um, just by sort of hybridizing the nucleic acid with, um, say, a pigment molecule. Um, this is a microarray. Um, so essentially each dot in the microarray um, 
it has sort of identical copies of a DNA, um, so carrying a sort of a specific gene, um, you can then see sort of which genes will bind to the red, which binds to the green, which sort of get expressed in both. Um, and then where it's sort of black, you get sort of that, the, the genes not being expressed. Um, and so they don't get to, they sort, of, sort of don't bind to either bit of the, the microarray. Um, and you can kind of see, okay, this cell um, is binding to our uh, um, specific gene. So this cell has the gene expression but this cell does not. And you can kind of look at the, the, the microarray there. Um, of course, um, cells don't exist in a vacuum. Um, lots of cells sort of communicate to other cells, uh, particularly during developmental processes. Um, so when genes are sort of being expressed in terms of uh, becoming um, like a multicellular organism, um, usually this occurs um, often via proteins. Um, sometimes there are other types of molecules like carbs and lipids, but often cell-to-cell -cell signaling is proteins. Um, but essentially it's sort of like um, passing a baton, right? If you think about um, uh, passing a baton during a relay race, right? Um, that you have the sort of initial um, sort of message, it goes to a target cell, um, and you kind of pass the message then sort of inside the cell. Um, it's very important in terms of coordinating cellular activity. Hormones do this all the time in terms of sort of the cell to cell signaling. Um, I, I get essentially what you get is sort of a a signal molecule, a chemical, uh, sort of traveling through the body, um, and it only will bind to a very specific receptor protein on sort of its target cell, um, and then that leads to a specific response by that target cell. It's called a signal transduction pathway. Um, so here, you can see here's our sort of signaling cell. Here's what's sending the message. Here's the little signaling molecule. That's the message. Um, here is the receptor protein on the target cell. So the receptor protein binds onto the little signaling molecule, and then we initiate this signal transduction pathway within the cell, where we're sort of passing the message on through all these different relay proteins. Um, and ultimately activating a transcription factor, um, which then go, can go into the nucleus and turn on the expression of some gene, uh, turn it into an mRNA transcript, and then that mRNA transcript can be translated into a new protein. And so our little signaling molecule here ultimately led to the formation of a new protein. This is, um, uh, for instance, how your thyroid hormone works in the body. Uh, thyroid hormone is sort of what revs up your metabolism, keeps your metabolism high, um, and this is how it does it, is to, through this sort of tra signal transduction pathway, turning on new genes within um, different cells. So my question here is, to turn on a gene, must that initial signal molecule actually enter the target cell? If we go back and look, you can see it doesn't have to. Sometimes the receptor protein that responds to that signaling molecule will be on the plasma membrane of the cell. Sometimes it will be inside the cell, but sometimes it will be um, just outside the cell. So the question, the, que the correct answer to that question is no. It does not actually have to enter a target cell in order to uh, turn on uh, a gene expression. Um, the sort of similarities amongst organisms um, in terms of sort of what these different signaling transduction pathways look like, um, even in very sort of simple organisms, uh, suggest that many of these um, pathways sort of evolved very early on in um, sort of the history of life on Earth. Um, so we see sort of similar transduction pathways um, from mm, simple archaea and back to prokarya, um, all the way up to um, complex multicellular eukaryotic organisms. You'll see some sort of similar um, transduction pathways. Um, and of course, if they're going to be on something sort of that's um, sort of evolutionarily old, um, 
and suggests that these pathways, um, or at least precursors to them, have been around for a very, very long time. So the next section of this chapter is about the cloning of plants and animals. Um, so here you can see Dolly. Um, so sort of the very first uh, multicellular organism uh, that ever got cloned in terms of animal life. Um, of course, at, we actually do cloning a lot, um, not really with animals. Um, although I have read some stories about people who are cloning their pets. Um, which of course there are some, some ethical sort of quandaries there. Um, but we actually do cloning a lot in plants. Um, so a clone is essentially an individual organism that is created by asexual reproduction that has sort of genetic identicality to a single parent. So rather than sort of sexual reproduction, uh, sperm plus egg, um, we're using asexual reproduction, so it's just a single parent, um, and the clone is then sort of identical to that parent. Um, so many cells are what we call totipotent, totipotent ugh, which means they are capable of kind of becoming every kind of cell in an organism. And um, some cells are really good and have a lot of totipotency uh, and some cells do not. Um, the other sort of thing that happens in terms of quote-unquote cloning is regeneration, um, sort of the regrowth of body parts. Um, and so uh, even though that differentiation has occurred, um, you can still sort of see the full genetic potential. So for instance, here we have a carrot. We can uh, pull some of the root cells of the carrot, which have already differentiated, they're root cells, they're not stem cells or um, leaf cells, they're root cells. Um, we can grow those cells in a medium. Um, in the culture, they will divide and go through mitosis and um, start to develop another little plantlet which will then ultimately grow into another adult plant. And now we have stem cells and leaf cells and root cells, even though we had only started with the sort of already differentiated root cells. And that was because there were cells that had totipotency. They had the ability to become leaf and stem cells um, because the DNA was already there. It just had to activate different genes during that differentiation process. Um, so we do cloning a, a lot with uh, any time if you've ever sort of taken a cutting from a plant and planted it and gave it some root starter, you're essentially doing cloning. Now, of course, um, <laughs> uh, cloning of plants um, shows us that um, differentiation is really about gene expression. Um, not sort of different genes or irreversible sort of changes in the genome. All the DNA is still there uh, in the root cells, for instance, with the carrot. We just have to activate different genes during that sort of mitosis process so that some of them can become root cells, some of them can become leaf cells, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, Cloning animals, of course, is much more complicated. Um, typically, we do it called nuclear transplantation. Uh, essentially, they take the DNA from a donor cell um, and they stick it into a host cell. That host cell has been sort of deprived of its nucleus. Um, and so by sort of sticking the DNA of one animal into sort of a, 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 a no nucleus uh, egg, um, you now have a clone of the the, the donor DNA. Um, if that particular animal that is being cloned is a mammal, so just like Dolly the sheep, um, then that sort of early embryonic stage, it's called blastocyst, um, will essentially get implanted in the uterus um, of some sort of surrogate mother. Um, so this is an example of what we call reproductive cloning um, because we get the birth of a new living organism. Um, so here you can see they've removed the nucleus from the egg. They've sort of add the donor cell, um, the nucleus from the donor cell, sort of implanted into the egg. Um, 
that egg goes through that it starts to go through mitosis we get that early sort of embryonic stage again it's called a blastocyst the blastocyst gets implanted into the surrogate mother and a clone of the original donor is born so that is uh, reproductive cloning with nuclear transplantation um, and of course there is all sorts of ethical um, sort of pitfalls in terms of um, cloning um, uh, well never mind cloning people but um, even just cloning pets and sheep and, um, and the, uh, many of the clones um, I, I think Dolly even Dolly for instance um, uh, she had some health issues um, and uh, lots of clones will typically have a shorter lifespan um, so while it seems like this is, you know wow we could you know have our pets forever for instance um, there are certainly um, some some sort of ethical guidelines that we have to kind of stop and think about and that sometimes maybe when we have the technology perhaps we should not use it um, now of course some of what we can get from um, sort of cloning um, uh, is using embryonic stem cells um, so for instance if you've ever had a kid um, and you saved your baby's cord blood um, that cord blood is full of embryonic stem cells and embryonic stem cells have much more of that totipotency than adult stem cells um, embryonic stem cells essentially have the ability to differentiate into practically any cell type in the body now adult stem cells can still go, go through mitosis in culture and grow in culture, and they can go through differentiation, but the, the cell types that you can get from an adult stem cell, much more limited than an embryonic stem cell. And so um, there are some very interesting um, sort of therapeutics being developed uh, using embryonic stem cells. Um, so here again, we take, we take the um, we look at that early embryonic stage, that blastocyst stage, and we um, pull out the stem cells, we can culture them, we can differentiate them in culture, and we can get both a nerve cell and uh, like a, a heart muscle cell, for instance. Conversely, if we were to look at some stem cells in the red marrow of an adult bone, um, they're still going to go through culture, and they'll still be able to be cultured, and they'll still be able to... Um, uh, sort of make more copies of themselves and, and to differentiate, but what they will differentiate to is different types of blood cells. So red blood cells versus white blood cells, different types of white blood cells. Um, but you couldn't take an adult, um, like bone marrow stem cell and grow a, a muscle or a nerve, but you could do so with an embryonic stem cell. Um, and some organ, organs in, in human bodies, for instance, heal really well. Skin, skin heals really well. Uh, bone heals really well. Nerves do not. Heart muscle does not. Um, and so there, there's some potential here by using embryonic stem cells that we can sort of grow um, potentially um, and sort of replace damaged um, cells. All right, we will end that part here. And the last little bit, um, which we'll talk about cancer, we will do in a separate lecture.